Hello and welcome to Lightways at Life Astrologer with me, Anna Isabel, and I am so excited because I'm welcoming back Victor Oliver. Hello, Victor. Hello, Anna. It, we keep meeting like this. I know. It's because you're so prolific in your work and there's always something interesting to talk about with you. And the latest great interesting thing is your new book. It's and fabulous. What it's I mean beautiful. by it's, it is absolutely stunning. It's called Secrets of the Signs and Planets. Well, astrology, really. Um, Secrets of the Signs and Planets. And so, you know, Victor, it was a book like this that was given to me for my 21st birthday, I think it was, either my 20th or my 21st birthday, that started me out on this journey. And so here you, here you are. Um, with this beautifully illustrated book. And I have to say that books like this that are introductions to astrology, in my mind, need to be beautifully illustrated <laughs> because they capture the imagination, don't you think? Well, everyone, uh, uh, I must say, I mean, it sounds like I'm boasting. I had nothing to do with the visuals, really, because I was commissioned to write produce the words you know and they'd shown me an earlier edition of the book which was how shall we put it politely complicated and uh, <laughs> and they asked my opinion I said well it's not wrong it's just that they're recycling I mean I'm sounding awfully rude and if, if I'm identified I'll probably be sued and rushed out of astrology but the fact of the matter is one of the problems with any subject, whether you're introducing the law, plumbing, electricity, whatever, is the recycling of phrases. And after a while, you have a suspicion that the, even the writer isn't quite certain. You know, I'd love to set a challenge to somebody to explain in about 10 words what precession of the equinoxes actually is. Because I've yet to read um, anybody explaining in very simple terms what it is. So that's just one aspect of astrology. And like you, I started out reading all the picture books and the people behind, behind this book, Flame Tree, wanted to produce a luscious coffee table type book that could somehow get across the sense of astrology without frightening everybody off in the process. So, I mean, I could have picked any page, just open the book, <laughs> any page, and here, and here is what I mean. It's wow. just absolutely gorgeous. And... Mm -hmm. It, I didn't choose that page. I just opened it because any page you open, there it's it gorgeous. is. It's, and it's only 10 pounds. How do they do it? <laughs> I, I, when I first saw it, I thought it'd be about 30 quid. Because if you write the book and then you think you control everything, but you don't really, you know. No, and the, the thing I love about it is that, so you have these beautiful illustrations and then you have exactly what I liked about the book that was given to me, which is simple explanations for things that just get you started. Yes. And really, I think a good introductory book is like a dictionary almost, because it, tell, it introduces you to the language. Because once you have enough of that vocabulary, then you could dive into the Liz Greens and all all of that wonderful books, all, the, all that wonderful writing that's so deep, like Melanie Reinhardt, et cetera. It's, but you need, you kind of need that vocabulary to begin with. And you, you need to have your imagination captured and your interest peaked um, to get there. You know, it's a very interesting point you're making. I mean, like you, I, I read a number of highly visual books um, you know, as you know, when I even before I thought I'd become an astrologer, I used to sort of leaf my way through these books and would stumble over the words usually because I've got a literal sort of mind, Mercury and Taurus. So don't get too abstract with me, just keep it nice and grounded, you know. And a lot of these books they were beautiful but not very grounded because they, they went into excessive explanation. Now, eventually. Like everything, you've got to immerse in the subject and learn the rules, because even in astrology, it's rule-based. It's not random, as you know yourself. I mean, who am I talking to? But uh, because we're talking to the great public of the world, you know, millions and trillions and all that. 
at least I imagine. And so one has to start, it's, you know, Wade Cave, I asked Wade, no, Wade Caves came to me. You know, you know Wade, don't you? The American astrologer. Great name though, Wade, isn't it? Uh, I, often, I wish I had been called Wade. Um, and I, he came to me with a great idea. He said, why don't we ask all these high and mighty astrologers what brought them into astrology in the first place? And so we were, ex I was expecting all sorts of, you know, uh, great figures, you know, Manilius and uh, William Lilly. And of course, even the great ones started with uh, um, Linda Goodman, Patrick Walker, Russell Grant. Linda. So the, the interface, the starting point will be the SAR signs, the pictures, the imagination, the magic. It, it, is, it is that. I, I am at the moment delighting in the fact that I have a nine-year-old pupil. And do you wow. know, <laughs> I know, and she's absolutely brilliant because her mind isn't cluttered with to-do lists. And so she absorbs everything very, very quickly. But what that has done is it's, made me really focus on simplicity how can i take big concepts and make them so simple that a nine-year-old gets them and and that has is has been a really brilliant exercise it was a bit like when i first started doing radio and we were doing phone-ins and the producer was behind the desk you know telling me few seconds to answer this really complicated question. And I'm like, oh God, you know? Um, and I could have said, no, this is trivializing, but I decided instead to distill so that it wasn't trivializing, it was still important. And it was a distillation um, of what I needed to get to this person. And that was an incredible discipline because it meant that I had to in about a minute, look at a chart, think what is the, the gist of this and get to the point. So this is, a, it's, and, and now teaching my, my little nine-year-old pupil is doing exactly the same thing in a different way. It's saying to me, okay, keep it simple. How do we get this across? And I'm having great fun doing that with her. Um, so this is your book in a sense, because it's not aimed at a nine-year-old, and thankfully it's not a few seconds in which to explain the whole of astrology. But what it does is it takes big concepts and it makes them digestible. It's little digestible bites that, shall we say it's, shall we keep with the food and say it's hors d'oeuvres so that you preparing for the main course, wetting the appetite. Wetting the appetite. I mean, so many people over the years have said to me, you know, where can I find out about astrology? Which is weird when you think about it. If you go to a books, bookshop, there'll be a section on esoteric stuff. And, um, but the, the usual complaint is, is, is either there's nothing to introduce you, you know, the hors d'oeuvre, or it's too complicated. Of course, a sufficient number of people get beyond all that and actually study the subject. I mean, my first serious astrology book was by Margaret Hone. Now, I never knew Margaret Hone. I'm sure she was a delightful person, but she writes like a dragon. And uh, <laughs> she's dead now, so she can't sue. And I think she was the first editor, I think, of the Astrological Journal. And um, But she was so severe, you know, and, you, and it, it was... Yeah, each page was like sort of trudging through toffee. And, um, but she knew her stuff. Of course, but then later on, this is another interesting thing. You better not tell your nine-year-old client this. But of course, these days, there are huge competitions. Will the moderns get them first? Or will the trads get them? Or the radishes, as I call them. Because the radish is the root. And all you ever hear from the lovely trads, and I love them all, is the root of things. If you talk to love Deb Holding, I loved it. She, she, I have an altar to Deborah. And if she's listened to this, she knows that I mean it. But the thing about her is it's always about the root. Where did it all start thousands of years ago? So I call them radishes. I call Lee Lehman a radish too, and she laughed. So it's not offensive. 
It's all said with love. See, I'm trying very hard not to laugh out loud, although, but I could easily have giggled through all of that. Um, you mustn't. You've got to hold yourself together. I, I have to, otherwise nobody's going to hear you. They'll just hear me laugh. So, um, moving beyond the spirit of mirth. And radishes. Slightly more seriously. It's more serious. Um, let's think about what you said you were talking about the root of the matter so let's talk about the root of the matter because i i like the fact that in the book you give a nice general introduction to how astrology evolves so tell us a little bit about that today just in case amongst my audience there are people who are just starting out well of course, I'm not going to do the history bit, and I'm in a very non-serious mood today, even though this is a very serious show. But um, it, we, we have to also smile a little bit. But of course, the history of astrology, what amazes a lot of neophytes, there's a word, newbies, is that we have a history that goes back many thousands of years. We've even got evidence that it could, as far back as 10,000 BC, early rudimentary understanding of what we now we call horoscope. But the actual zodiac itself, which is the basis of astrology, was first created around 400 BC-ish by the Babylonians, I think under Persian rule. And they were the first to divide the sky up into 30 degree pineapple chunks, if you like. And each 30 degree segment is one of the star signs or sun signs, uh, which is based inspirationally on, on the major constellations within the sun's pathway that seemingly passes around the earth. And um, that was the basis of, of the zodiac. Of course, that's become a controversial area over time, and we can talk about that as well. But it's, it, it, astrology wasn't born on a given day under the star of Bethlehem or anything like that. It evolved over time through different traditions, as you know yourself. And at some point there was a separation into what we call the tropical system, which we operate in the West, uh, practice in the West, and the Siderists, um, more practice in the East. Although I, I think I'm seeing more of a blending going on at the moment. Interesting developments are always going on in astrology. And one can talk about certain famous people and this, that, and the other, but in essence, it was a, an evolution. And of course, um, the ancient astronomers were nothing more than astrologers because it, up to a certain point, the understanding of the skies also had a mystical meaning. And the divinatory element really arises from what we could see in the sky and the patterns that we saw. You know, if we call the sign cancer, it's because the constellation looks a bit like a crab. And people make something of this to say, well, they, it's just an optical illusion. You're seeing shapes and patterns. Well, that's the starting point for divination symbols and if you can get beyond that rather simple idea crazy as it sounds you're halfway to being an astrologer so many things there the firstly when you were talking about the fact that it's an evolutionary system and i think we've made it quite clear by now that there are different strands of thought um that and that's because it is a system that has evolved and because it's a system that has evolved there are going to be different perspectives different ways of operating there are people who are quite rightly very rooted in the tradition um, that's there and and then there are others who have branched out a little bit and perhaps translated it into a more modern psychological um, perspective um, there's always going to be, there's, there's those who have a more literal, and perhaps a more literal view of the relationship between the heavens and the chart who would be practicing sidereal. Um, and then there's others who are working more with the idea that, well, it's symbolic, therefore we keep it with as tropical. And it's, it's, um, it's a very wide now, um, way of operating and that's because it has evolved through so many thousands of years and different people are going to interpret in different ways um, there are going to be lots of things that we have in common i think for me i'm kind of a weird 
blend of traditional and psychological in that I have, I go back to the traditional for understanding the origins of things. And I always teach my, my students where, why things have evolved in the way that they have and the different views that are there. But ultimately, I'm also an analytical hypnotherapist, and therefore, I'm a psychological astrologer, because that's the, the, the tool, that's the use that I have for this tool. Were I practicing divina divination, a more, divination uh, a more divinatory approach, then I would definitely be much more grounded in the traditional techniques. So it's, I think it's what I'm illustrating by my approach is how it is that it can evolve in so many ways. And, you know, earlier today, I was having a conversation with my partner about spelling um, right. because we're having a, a giggle. You know, we were saying occasionally, you know, how many C's and how many L's do we need? And I was talking about how in many countries there has been over time a simplification you know the portuguese got rid of their y's and their w's um the americans as we know have different spellings to the british Indeed. because they've simplified things and then i thought and, and i know the french have done the same um and i thought well why haven't we because it would make things a lot easier and then i thought no we can't do that and that's because our history is expressed in our language and all the the quirky it's it's like the difference between having uh streets that are cities that are built on a grid system and having the windy roads that kind of tell the story of how the city evolved and i think astrology is like that it's got these quirky little corners here and there it's certainly not a grid system um and it's certainly not we have had attempts to simplify it and some people like those and some people don't. And that's where we are. Modern, what we call, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit sort of skeptical about these labels because, but if you want to talk about the moderns, the modern astrology, that's very much uh, source to Alan Leo, you know, going back to the early 20th century where he created a greater focus on, on the sun signs and things like that, which in a funny sort of way was a feature of media relationships and making things more packageable, if there's such a word. And I like this idea of evolution because the strange thing about astrology is that it is a shape-shifting discipline. And it will, whether people like it or not, whether they want to live 5,000 years ago or pretend that Uranus doesn't exist because it, you know, William really, really didn't know about it. But the fact of the matter is whether people like it or not, astrology absorbs its culture. And each culture makes the astrology into something that it understands. And I mean, take you, for example, you've incorporated astrology and psychology into your own discipline. Exactly. And it's, you know, I was, I was just thinking also about how you were saying each generation makes it its own, essentially. Each culture makes it its own. We do that with legends. We if do. we look at legends, if we look at the, you know, the story of Robin Hood, if we look at fairy tales, very few people know that originally um, Snow White did not have a stepmother. It was her mother who behaved in that way towards her. <laughs> but we, at some point, got a bit squeamish about the, the prospect of a mother behaving that way um, towards her own child. Yes. So things change over time and we, because we do make it our own and we are faced now with very exciting dwarf planets. And it, I, I love working with Eris. And I love working with um, the centaurs, not dwarf planets. Let's say their relations of Chiron. Um, <laughs> but I love working with them. And I love the additional dimensions of human psychology mm. that they bring to it. On the other hand, when I'm thinking and wanting to keep things simple, I will, I, to begin with, leave them out. Because actually, there's quite a lot of the human psyche that's very well explained with the, the original 
the original seven. Absolutely. We didn't have to revise everything. I mean, I'm getting very much into, not that I want to take this into complexities, but there's a lunar point called Black Moon Lilith, which you'll know about. There are three Liliths, but the Black Moon Lilith is basically the furthest point the moon gets in its orbit around the Earth. And it's associated with primal things, but also secret things, sometimes taboos and stigma. And I'm discovering over and over again, simply by examining the charts, how they relate to clients' lives and things like that and how much they work. So astrology is a very dynamic discipline. It's not just about reading some old text that's been dug up someplace. There's a lot to be learned by all these recovered techniques and fascinating they are but they do actually reflect a very different cosmology and also approach to the horoscope. So that if you're looking at old systems, there will be a tendency to be rather, if not judgmental, rather a little too definitive about what's bad and what's good, it, such as in the expression of the word malefic and benefic. I understand, we understand what these mean, but we also know that through aspects and other positions, it's not as simple as that. And I think what modern astrology has done is to nuance the horoscope to make it more adaptable, but that's not to reject the traditional approaches. But I'm interested in your nine-year-old client. What if she had gone to a traditionalist to start with? Yes, it's that. That's a thought. Um, I think I can hear Deborah Holding's voice in my head now. <laughs> <laughs> Watch what you say. Um, <laughs> um, I watched your video with her. Most interesting. Uh, and I, I love very lively debate. Her. I absolutely love her work, and it it actually really has fed into my work, um, and that's why I said I can't say I'm not a traditionalist, and I can't say that I'm you know purely a psychological astrologer because I feel I have I have blended the two, and Deborah Holding is one of the reasons for that. Yeah. So it it's it reading her book I went oh that's why that makes so much more sense and so it completely is is very important so and for those of you who have missed it I shall put a link to Deborah's interview in highly the recommend it highly rec because it's, it's really I recommend good. her book temples in the sky because I though I don't agree with everything in it but what you cannot dispute is that she's distilled the history of things and separated the signs from the planets and the rulerships yeah. and one thing and another. And it works. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so I think coming back to my nine-year-old, my concern with the traditional approach would be if I was teaching a child, how could I make this less scary that's my yes. concern yes because with how can i make it more and i without taking away the depth without taking away the fact of the matter is it's in the word judgment when you're doing an orary chart mm -hmm. it's a judgment you're pronouncing on a question of course you are because you're looking for a yes or no answer yes so therefore, benefic, malefic makes absolute sense. Yeah. It's, it's, it is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a judgment. So if I was teaching traditional astrology to a nine-year-old, I would have to make absolutely sure that this is what it was understood, as I would perhaps change the words malefic to, uh, and benefic to helpful and challenging. Yeah. So that when we're looking and determining what is the answer to this question, it's I'm not taking away from the yes or no, but I'm perhaps making it less scary. Because here what we have at the heart of this discussion is. Is a yes or no absolute faith? or a, a faith fate absolute fate or is it a really probable answer and is there anything and of course you know the wonderful thing about horary is that it kind of covers that because it goes okay well this is what might happen but look at look venus is 
about to translate light here and you know that's a modifier and maybe so it's so it's kind of built in and i think maybe and i think deborah holding would agree with this <laughs> we all need before we say that it's scary or that it's we need to understand the system better because once we understand i i feel that if we were to understand the horary system better we would see nuances there because for instance um just the idea of the, the humors and temperament that is like you know that is psychological astrology right there yes so the, they just had a different language to express it to the one that we're and that's why i'm it sounds like i'm sitting on the fence arguing both sides <laughs> but genuinely i think it's because where i'm sitting i value both hugely and i feel like i want to to act as translator mm. from ancient to modern and bring with me that beauty that i'm seeing in the traditional there's great beauty and great wisdom, but of course it's all in the teacher as well. And I definitely have come to the view that the, the, the kind of astrology you end up practicing will to some extent be an expression of one's personality and expectations. So if I can put this as diplomatically as possible, people who see the world in a rather manichaean way, or a black and white, and are quite judgmental, may be drawn to the more ancient traditions where there appears to be that kind of judgmentalism. Whereas in fact, another person might come to the subject with perhaps a more inclusive sort of approach to life and actually view it in a different way. A number of traditionists are fusing the old, the old systems with psychological and modern approaches. I'm very interested too, I, was, uh, look, uh, I gave a talk in Blackpool recently and I was looking at how astrology has always basically run the world. I mean, I've written this 6,000 word essay. I'm trying to think where to put it. But uh, what I found striking about it is that um, astrology has always been there, but in so many different ways. And I wanted to get across the reality that we've always gone to, us, to our astrologers, you know, whether you're Ronald Reagan, whether you're Diana, whether you're this, whether you're that. And I just wanted to get across that sense that um, astrology comes in so many different guises. And in the end, uh, the astrology is as good as the person you consult. I agree. And ultimately, again, what this, what our conversation is demonstrating is how highly individual it is. So it's individual for the person consulting the astrologer, but it's individual in the, in terms of what the astrologer is bringing to the consultation. Um, it can only ever be that because this is a beautiful subjective um, system. I think also that the nuance that's there, and you were talking about, you know, different personalities coming to perhaps look at it, 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 be attracted to different systems of astrology. But I can think of people who are practicing psychological astrology having a very fatalistic view to it oh. in terms of judging character and um, mm. I, now hear Stephen Forrest's voice too, because he's we're we're very much you know on this as you 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 can't say that this configuration is going to mean absolutely this that this is bad that this is good and yet I've seen that I've seen people's characters being determined as good or bad by virtue of the fact that they've got you know, a great deal of Pluto or a great deal of Venus. And it's not like that. It makes me hop up and down. Um, me too. Yeah, and, and, and Stephen as well. <laughs> I think I, I've always been, all my life, you know, when I was studying the law, I thought all lawyers are going to be wonderful. And of course, I discovered that was so not true. 
And then I thought, oh, writers, writers all are lovely. Oh, no, I don't think so. And it's the same, I'm afraid, in astrology. The astrology is not necessarily going to raise your personal bar. I mean, if you're going to act like some knitting, knitting person at the guillotine and you take up astrology, you'll end up sounding like an astrologer who knits at the guillotine. But you see, <laughs> that's brilliant because whoever would have thought that a knitting and the guillotine go together and that image, that's it, isn't it? Because what it shows is that nothing in the world can be seen to be completely innocuous and nothing in the world could be seen as being completely malevolent unless it is perhaps the guillotine. <laughs> the guillotine is, uh, well, it's providing an entertainment, perhaps not as we would have it. And of course, I wouldn't want to be encountering a, a, a maniac wielding a knitting needle. You know, but as you say, it's that complacent or rather relaxing activity of making perhaps a little jumper for your little Johnny or whatever, or Jean, and watching a head rolling. And I, I mean, it appeals to me, I must admit, as, a, as an absurd sort of image. Um, <laughs> there's another point I wanted to make. You know, we were talking about how the culture is somehow absorbed by astrology. I'm noticing another new trend. Um, which we can claim between us, we have found, <laughs> is that um, as part of my Blackpool talk, I, I was talking about all these apps that are coming up, uh, you know, dating apps and stuff like that. And there's one called The Pattern, which was created by someone called Lisa Donovan, who's mega rich and everything. But I'll tell you what's interesting about what she's done with astrology. She's stripped out the sun signs. And what she's done is that she's converted many of the energies in the horoscope in, through the planetary positions and aspects into distillations. And you don't, it doesn't really matter whether you're a Libra, Gemini or a Capricorn. And just as much as sun signs became so prominent in the 20th century, and still is the case, I mean, our starting point is where is the sun? I can see the day when the algorithms will kind of it's all a bit incidental whether you're a Libra or a Gemini. I mean, it sounds crazy. It's the craziest thing I've ever said. But I can see it happening because the app is rather good. I'm dating myself at the moment, by the way. I, I created two identities. Victor's dating Victor. So I'll get this little message saying, oh, you're, you're, you're looking into the eyes of Victor today. You can see things. So I look in the mirror and say, yeah. I, I think that's absolutely hilarious. This might be perhaps where I part company with modernity. Uh, <laughs> that might be the line. <laughs> I, may, I may join you. <laughs> I, I think that's where I, uh, that's probably where I say, okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I think that might be becoming a little bit too glib for me. Um, but, <laughs> but I can also see that as a point of introduction for people, um that's i can see that that there would be an attraction with that and um i love that you're testing it out like this i, I think that's just well it's very gemini <laughs> it's very very various rising you know you've heard it all before you know but <laughs> even in my draconic stuff you know we've talked about i won't go on about draconics today but when i'm looking at the tropic and draconic charts quite often i i, I don't really look at the sun because I'm more interested in the underlying energies uh, that's going See, that's on. That's the thing, the is interplay. that it depends. It yeah. depends on what the purpose of the consultation is. Yes, there is that point. Because very often in my work, what's being required is for the person to gain a better understanding of who they are. Ah, well, yes. We've got to start with the, the sun. sun. Is, <laughs> the sun is the starting point. On the other hand, if I've got somebody in front of me, who is steeped in family issues and mother, well, you know where I'm going first. It'll be the moon. And let's not forget the ascendant because the ascendant is the childhood yeah. as well and the first house. So for my work, that's often my starting point, the sun, the first house inevitably somewhere and, and then the moon. But if somebody comes to me and says, oh, I want career advice, well, it's straight to the midheaven. So it's 
as a starting point, because obviously the sun has an important part to play in that as means of self-expression, etc. So you, it just depends on what you're looking for, because as much as I have perhaps an hour and a half, most of the time to sit with a client, sometimes they only want half an hour. Half an hour is not a long time. I've got to get to the nub of it quickly, but at least it's not a few seconds on radio. <laughs> well, you're well trained to, uh, to uh, work to a deadline. It, it's certainly uh, working to a deadline is one of the things. So Victor, I, I will also say that one of the great things that I've enjoyed about your book is the, the quotes. Ah, the quotes. The lovely quotes that are in there. And something else that I would have really liked in my first book, which I did not have, is when you introduce the houses, you have a beautiful diagram. I'm just looking for it. Ah, here it is. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah, a guide to what is in the horoscope. And I'm just bringing it back. So we've got the full picture there. And I, I really, when I saw that, I thought, if I was going to do a book of this type, I would have had that because I give this to my students when I'm introducing the houses is exactly this. And in fact, um, I start all, from day one, I start showing them the chart and going, okay, so this is what's what. Um, so I really like that. And that's the kind of thoughtful thing that I really value in your book. So if you Thank are you. new to astrology, this is the book you want. It's, it'd make a lovely, and you could, if you drop that on an ant's nest, you could wipe it out because it's so heavy. <laughs> it's your quality, but not that you want to wipe out an ant's nest. I mean, no, I, I think, you know, ants have uh, the right to existence also. They do. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> if you also, if you have somebody in your life who is interested, but hasn't really got a handle on things or doesn't know where to go, this is a, a great place to start so victor bulk buy, bulk buy is that what i say please a lot of friends and loved ones indeed so if you um again you know new year's coming and this is a great way if you're wanting to deep to really get into astrology great starting point thank victor you. thank you for your lovely book and for a wonderful another wonderful conversation we, we've covered a lot of ground today. Yes. And we may make a quick appeal. Please, if you're having a baby, record its time. Please. I second that. I you second. Know? Because that way we find out your rising sign near midheaven and all the rest of it. Mm. Yeah, I, I would second that. So okay. thank you. And thank you all for watching. Uh, now, next time, funnily enough, we're still talking about astrology we're talking about the nature of astrology of course we're talking about astrology this is a program about astrology but what i mean is we continue with examining the more philosophical aspects of astrology and until then do check out my website and um because there are some great courses that are starting right on introduction to astrology and then also the second part to introduction to astrology and so if you've missed the first part, but you feel like you've got the basics already, you can go straight into the second. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>